I'm happy to be here, um, in part because I think, you know, people often ask me, so what are you? Are you an activist? Are you a poet? Do you write in Persian? Um, are you a nonfiction writer? Are you a columnist? Every once in a while I show up on uh, various television and radio broadcasts uh, talking, you know, like pinheads about Iran. Um, so people, especially young people who, who are aspiring writers ask me, what are you? And which one of these things are you? And, and I think um, the answer often is that all of these things are about one thing. Um, it's about telling, and it's about truth-telling. Um, and, and to me, um, from the bottom of my heart, I think it's about being Jewish in a way that feels uh, authentic and, and uh, genuine to me. I have never been good at uh, ritualistic aspects of Judaism. I've never, unlike uh, some of the other members of my family, I have never been comfortable um, with, with uh, particular rituals. But, in, in some certain and deep ways, I've always also felt uh, extremely Jewish. And I think some, somehow um, my experience of being a Jew is deeply intertwined with the notion of telling um, in every possible shape or form, whether it's a column or a poem or, um, or a book of nonfiction or uh, an op-ed. Uh, all of these things is about being engaged in the world and finding ways in, in that observation to tell the things that other people uh, either wish us to forget or want us to um, walk past and not recognize. So, um, so this is what I do. I, um, when I look back at my first 18, 19 years of my life in Iran, um, where I find a very rich source of, uh, almost bottomless source of material uh, to write about um, for the rest of my life, possibly. Um, I look at the things that I, uh, I should write about. What, what would a um, Jewish American Iranian person who is looking back at those 18 years uh, say that other people are um, with the same experiences in Iran are reluctant to say. And I often find that the stories of minorities, uh, the, the, stories of, um, the stories that the regime has been trying to bury are, are the things that I find myself most compelled to write about. Um, and therefore, from, from this impetus came uh, my memoir, Journey from the Land of No, which is the title of, of uh, the talk this evening, I've chosen two passages uh, to read to you from it because I think it would be um, probably helpful in terms of creating a backdrop for this conversation um, for you to hear, go back to the beginning in a way of, of contemporary Iran, which, uh, which obviously begins in 1979 with the rise of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini to power, with, with the fall of the Pahlavi regime. Um, and, and I was uh, barely a teenager at the time in Iran, and, um, and so the, the subject of the memoir is really my observations of, of those 10 years during which Iran transformed, 1974 to 1984, which is the year that uh, my mother and I left Iran. I remember being, uh, coming to America in 1985 and uh, being actually in a dormitory, girls' dormitory, um, of, of Stern College, Yeshiva University in New York, and um, my, my fellow uh, roommates would ask me uh, where I was from, and I would say Iran, and people uh, were startled um, and would address me with a second question saying, are there Jews in Iran? And we would be just about wrapping up our celebration of Purim. Um, when I would be asked those kinds of questions. So I, I often found that um, uh, there, are, there, there are two or three or four stories, mainly, and la namely the stories of um, minorities in Iran, or not, at, not in terms of numbers, but in terms of power, um, couching them as minorities. Uh, women, uh, religious minorities, uh, go untold uh, when it comes to Iran. And, and so I was compelled to um, write this memoir to talk about uh, what it was like to, to be in Iran 
uh, prior to the Iranian Revolution and after uh, as a woman, as a Jewish person, and as a secular person. Um, you know, there are uh, large numbers of uh, educated, middle-class, secular Iranians who, uh, in terms of power, also fall into a category of minorities. And, and so this is a passage from December of 1978, when, um, when the Shah of Iran, the, the king from the last dynasty, Pahlavi dynasty, uh, is teetering on the brink. And uh, when Ayatollah Khomeini, the, the person, uh, the clergyman who at the time was in the suburbs of Paris in France, uh, orchestrating uh, the, the Iranian revolution, uh, was still there and, and, uh, and much of Iran was actually, uh, in a way, shut down. There were strikes everywhere, there were demonstrations all day long, uh, martial law uh, by December of 1978 had been put into effect. Um, when, when Egypt was erupting a couple of years ago, Tahrir Square very much uh, reminded me uh, of Iran of 1978 and 1979, and I wrote a piece about it, uh, making comparisons between between Iran of back then and uh, Egypt of 2011. And a lot of Egyptian Egyptian activists got mad at me, wrote me back saying, "We won't do what what you people did in Iran." And I said, "I, I surely hope so. I I meant to write this to to say these are the mistakes that I think um, the secular movement in Iran made, and these are." Um, I hope you, you pay attention to them in order not to repeat those mistakes. Um, but December of 1978 in Iran was, was a very exciting time. Um, and um, while you in the West may have been looking at, at the images coming from Iran in December of 1978, although I think uh, Americans started paying attention to Iran about a year later after the, after the seizure of the American embassy, um, but I think you were seeing something entirely different. Uh, Iran in December of 1978 was a very hopeful place. Um, and especially in the big cities, in the city that I was, Tehran, it looked like things were going in the right direction, that a dictatorship, a monarchy was going to fall, and, uh, and democracy was, was about to uh, come to Iran. And. Uh, one of the very interesting things that uh, Ayatollah Khomeini was doing, uh, even from a distance from exile in France, was to come up with very ingenious um, ways to orchestrate the demonstrations in ways that he could unify both the secular Iranians and religious Iranians around things that seemed harmless, that ideologically could join everyone together without being too radical in one way or another. And, and one of those acts was a peaceful uh, act of demonstration, which I think um, sparked the imagination of people across the Middle East. And that was for people to um, not do a big demonstration or a march on the streets, but to turn off their lights inside their homes. <clears throat> At, at, at a particular time, everybody had been ordered to turn off their lights at 9 p.m. at night. This is December, so it was pitch dark already. Um, and go to their rooftops at 9 o'clock. And for a period of 15 minutes, every, everyone throughout Iran was invited to chant only one slogan, um, nothing else. And that slogan was, in Arabic, Allahu Akbar, uh, God is great. And uh, it seems very simple, but <laughs> it, it was uh, amazing. And the passage that I'm about to read to you, which I keep delaying, is from December of 1978. Uh, it's about 8.45, and I'm, I'm a very curious little Jewish girl who knows something is going on, but, but in the absence of a free press, um, doesn't have access to much information, and um, has decided to go to the rooftop and, and see what in the world is going on. And so without further ado. At 8.45 PM, the lights in the homes began to go off one by one. By 8.55 PM, 
Not even the night was as dark as our neighborhood. All but the heavenly bodies had heeded the Ayatollah's message. Under the full moons, the antennas and the tin chimneys emanated a silvery glow, enhancing the majesty of the dark. Nothing hung from the clotheslines, not even pins. The neighbors were on the balconies and rooftops, even those with no intention to chant. And that was just what the Ayatollah did. He dazzled even his enemies by the power of his spectacles. Darkness had rendered all faces immaterial. The eye could only see the outlines of the crowd, some short, others tall, some hunched, a few seated. Those were the cynics waiting to see if the night would compel them to join. For the first time since I knew Z, her family had come together in one place. Great uncle next to Mrs. Banu, who stood beside her husband, each holding one of the twins. Z's brothers tossed the rock in their hands. Bibi rested an arm on Z's shoulder. This was the Ayatollah's first miracle, a family united. And my family? I hopped over the dividers between the rooftops and joined my parents. Father was repeating under his breath. Helen, do you see this? For as long as the eye can see, one stinking mullah can do all this? To commit what was memorable to mind, father always needed mother as a witness. Shh, she elbowed him. He teased her. Try to say Allahu Akbar, Helen, or we would risk irking the guim. Could I say Allahu Akbar? The words echoed in my mind, but I could not utter them. Say it, I urged myself. One, two, three, but I could not. I had never had to say words in Arabic to chant in a language other than my native Persian. I had never been expected to sound like a Muslim. Must I choose? My heart was fluttering in my chest and everywhere else. Excitement pulsated in my ears. It throbbed in my belly. I feared something unknown. I was brimming with the thrill of something unknown. My parents were scared, whereas no one around us seemed to be. Z signaled me from the distance, inviting me to join her family. And I found myself torn between staying on our rooftop or going to hers. Suddenly, I envied Z, who was standing among her siblings. I envied their togetherness, their certainty, their eager anticipation for nine o'clock to strike. At 8.57 p.m., two rocks struck the bulbs of the light poles at each end of the alley. The skitter of the shards against the asphalt in an alley so hushed sounded as if a, th a thousand glass bottles had shattered. No one said a word. At 8.58, our alley, the alley of the distinguished, stretched like a common alley, dark and desolate. But at nine, it came to life. Moans of Allahu Akbar billowed through the night. They were not orchestrated sounds, but fitful scattered through the alley. They rose as if every person's throat had been clutched. Their chests heaved with each breath. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Each Allah expanded in the windpipes, inhaling air as if it were rapidly running out. For every gasp, a hundred more echoed in sympathy. The Allah strolled longer with each chant, H's barely fading under the Akbars until all fizzled into a single Allah, greatness slowly sundering, then dissipating in the intoxicated throats. The cloud of a single plea plumed over the alley. By 9.08, the plea was a desperation reverberating in his name. Allah and not another word. Allah and it sealed all the untold. Every home a heap of kindling. The alley was a bonfire. Phantom flames had scorched the neighborhood. A thick sonorous smoke hovered over every home. Every man, every woman, every child was burning. Everyone a victim everyone an arsonist. 
Um, so this was December of 1978. Uh, by end of January of 1979, uh, the Shah of Iran leaves. Um, he thought it was, probably thought, I think he did, uh, it was going to be a temporary departure, that he was, things were going to go back to normal. He was going to come back again. Uh, but obviously, by middle of February, uh, the entire history of monarchy in Iran uh, was disassembled, came apart, and, um, and an Islamic Republic was established. When I was writing this book, this memoir, my editor asked me, when did you know uh, that democracy was not the thing that was going to come out of the Iranian revolution. When, when did it become clear to you? Because we had this argument that uh, somehow Americans knew it better than we did because we were inside and we had a different view and um, Americans were looking at images that were scary to them uh, by, you know, by various standards. Um, and, and so in some ways perhaps Americans knew better what was going to be in store for Iran, uh, rather than Iranians inside. And of course, my being just a mere teenager, notwithstanding. And so I had to figure out, um, at least for the purposes of a memoir, um, when I thought as a teenager, when I realized that um, things were going in a, in a hopeless direction. And, um, and that was a day it was not the hostage crisis, it was not, um, it should have been so many other things, but they weren't. It was something that actually tangibly had, had a lot to do with my life. And that was when um, our Hebrew day school, the, the Jewish school that I used to attend, uh, was taken over. I say taken over because um, even until, even today, there are uh, Jewish schools operating in Iran. Prior to the Iranian revolution, there were um, perfectly good, legitimate Jewish schools run by uh, Jewish administrators uh, in Iran. And um, in 1982, which is the timing of this second passage, um, I, I still had, the, my school, my Hebrew day school, was still run uh, by a Jewish administration principal, assistant principal, and so on and so forth. But then um, it was in the middle of the day and the bell rang at an unusual time. And over the intercom system, we were all called uh, to go into the lunchroom, which was in the basement, uh, to listen to a special announcement. So we all, you know, uh, rushed to the lunchroom. And, um, and our, over this, on top of this makeshift stage in the lunchroom, um, right next to our own principal, a woman in a black veil is standing. Now, um, many of you may know, many may not know, that the, the veil in Iran, the, the choice of dress code had, or had existed in Iran. Um, and even after the rise of Ayatollah to power in 1979, he could not uh, take the right of dress code uh, that women in Iran were enjoying uh, immediately away. It took a while for him to be able to overturn uh, the right to dress code. So um, it, by 1982, it, was, it, it had almost been brought back, and people um, in uh, official government spaces uh, had been forced, women, to, to put it on, and, and soon thereafter, uh, the streets, uh, having, having a veil or a scarf on the streets, no matter who you were and where you came from, um, if you were a woman, you had to put it on, became mandatory too. Um, but, but this woman was standing next to our, next to our principal in a, in a black veil, and <clears throat> the black veil especially signifies uh, conservatism because there are all shades of veils in Iran and there are all sorts of ways in which you can um, put your you know, Islamic dress code on and um, whether or not it's an actual, you know, and what the shade of your veil is and how you put it on determines where in the political spectrum you and your ideology or your belief system falls, which is very interesting. It's sort of like the snow to the Eskimos. You know, there are 30 different snows and so there are many different kinds of veils. Um, so the fact that this was a woman uh, dressed in a black veil standing 
uh, on the makeshift stage of, of our lunchroom um, had, had major implications. And, and she took a bullhorn and she introduced herself as, as our new principal. Uh, and uh, I know you're all aghast, but we were um, 15, 14, 15, and 16 year old teenage girls, we all started giggling. Um, our parents were terrified at night when, when we returned home and told them, but we just thought this was hilarious because she looked hilarious and, and the whole uh, scene of uh, having this tiny woman in this garb, uh, giving, holding the bullhorn in front of her face and giving us speeches, um, a passage of which I'll read to you, uh, was was very funny or you know fortunately for us being a teenager we found it funny as opposed to terrifying now I'm going to read this to you even though um, my probably my parents would say a respectable Jewish girl would not read a speech like this in front of a respectable crowd um, but but I'm going to read it because I think uh, at the end of the day much of the tension uh, today in the Middle East is is, a, uh, is about misogyny, that uh, as much as it looks like Shiism versus Sunnism or uh, the Saudis versus the Iranians and so on and so forth, um, deep in my heart, I actually think it's about um, male dominance and the fact that a group of men in the Middle East have decided that they want to stay in power at any, at any cost. Um, you may disagree. But, but the passage that I'm about to read to you um, will perhaps, um, in, in a humorous way, I hope, uh, make clear that uh, from early on in Iran, the notion of gender was very much embedded in, in uh, this new regime, in the ideology of the new regime. So this woman in a black veil used, um, had, had come and taken over our Hebrew school um, because she uh, had this notion that she could convert us all into Islam. And, <clears throat> and to this day, what, what uh, remains very uh, mind-blowing to me was that whoever assigned her to this task must have never auditioned her because <laughs> she was just terrible uh, at the job. And, and uh, lo and behold, at the end of her tenure at our school, um, nobody ever converted. And then she moved to Christian schools and, and other uh, minority schools and no one there converted either. Uh, but that didn't stop her from trying. And later on she became a representative to the Iranian parliament and, um, and about uh, one or two terms later she didn't manage to gather any votes either. But, <laughs> uh, but there she was at our school um, and she had sacked our entire Hebrew and English classes in the afternoons because she was going to give us these speeches about why, why we should consider Islam as the ultimate religion. That um, even though Moses and Jesus were religious prophets um, who had been mentioned, who were, uh, had been mentioned in the Quran and uh, Jews and Christians were people of the book, uh, but that in fact God had sent Prophet Muhammad uh, because uh, there was something that, some unfinished business that Prophet Muhammad um, had come to finish and that all the good people of the book needed to now turn to this final, final prophet or the seal of all prophets um, in order to continue in the path that Moses and Jesus had started. Um, but no matter what philosophical premise she would set for herself, the um, very quickly after about um, one or two minutes, um, the entire speech would become um, is, would would center around the subject of sex, which brings me back to my earlier um, comment. So I will read you a couple of uh, passages from from these many speeches, and uh, the responsibility of this is. Uh, the disclaimer is that uh, this is all me, not AJC, so continue to support AJC. <laughs> um, her name was Mrs. Moradam, and what you need to picture in your mind's eye is that uh, she had a scarf on, a baggy uniform, which was sort of like a raincoat. Underneath the baggy uniform, um, which was completely covered up, she had uh, pants, 
and closed-toed shoes, and on top of everything, she had a black veil. And when she was perfectly comfortable in our presence, she would only take the veil off, but, but that, that was it. And the rest of her body was still totally covered. And her name was Mrs. Morata. And this is her speaking. 1982. My dear sisters, daughters of our great revolution, it is now time for you to learn about the delicious topic of corporeal sin. Yes, my sisters, young and innocent as you are in your pubescent splendor, you're also diabolical. Diabolical and no less. Duty compels me to warn you of the perniciousness you all possess. You do possess it and you don't even know it. Abomination lurks beneath your innocence. Oh, how loathsome it is, how lethal, more baneful than the hatchet of the Satan himself. Oh, my sisters, I will walk on hot coals, throw myself in the way of eternal whirlwinds, die before I allow you to let loose, unknowing as you are, the evil, the apocalypse that only you could bring upon us. You're certainly wondering how on earth you are capable of drowning everything in eternal darkness. You're asking yourselves, of what apocalypse is our beloved principle speaking? <laughs> ah, but I tell you, I speak of the apocalypse of your hair. Yes, hair, such a simple word, so seemingly dead and blameless. But my dear girls, blameless it is not. It is constantly scheming to reveal itself peeking out of the scarf even from under the veil. It peeks not to reveal itself to me or you or your peers in this room, but to a man. You heard me right. Your long, beautiful hair is the very snake that deceived Eve, who then deceived Adam. That vile reptile never stopped. Hundreds of years later, it still deceives. One glance at your hair, even a strand of your hair, is enough to turn any man into an irredeemable wanton, into a unicorn beast with a unique intention, each of his heinous tissues in unanimity, its projectile moving in a unified direction, that of sin. Once the beast unleashes itself upon your innocence, you're not a child of Allah anymore. You're a child of Satan, and appropriate to your kinship, you deserve to receive a hail of stones and nothing less. By now you fully understand what evil I speak of. I shall spare you the obscene. What it is, I'm afraid, up to me to teach you how to avoid it. If a man walks into this hall at this very moment that I stand before you without my veil, what must we do? You look at me and you say, but Mrs. Mohadam is covered from head to toe. We can't even see a strand of her hair. Even now that I have my scarf pulled to the edge of my eyebrows and its trail covers all of my neck, even now that my long sleeves reach my knuckles and my uniform touches my ankles, even now, my sisters, daughters of a glorious revolution, that my pants fall to the heel of my shoe and my shoes leave not a centimeter, not even a millimeter of skin exposed, even now I feel naked. You heard me right, naked if a man were to walk in. In the West, in that superficial, artificial, morally corrupt country called America, where they know not of God, where they live by the rules of Satan, where they drink alcohol instead of water, consume an animal as filthy as a pig, and lead promiscuous lives, where women walk naked in the streets, fornicate in public, and conduct orgies in their homes, no? Anyone? <laughs> there, the headmasters train their students for insignificant trials for an emergency such as fire. They conduct fire drills in their schools. But we, my sisters, daughters of our great revolution, we're not afraid of earthly threats. We fear only one fire, the eternal fire of hell. So the drill that I'm preparing you for is a man drill. Learn this and you've bought yourselves a one-way ticket out of hell. 
If a man were to walk into this room, I, naked as I feel, without my veil, would have no choice but to pull the hem of my uniform over my head. And then you say to yourselves what Mrs. Mohadam would be exposing her body. But at that moment of emergency, when I have not a second to lose, I must cover my head better than any other part. So girls, if I scream, man, 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 what must you do? Run if you can. And if you can't, hide. And if you can't hide, surrender and pull the hem of your uniforms over your heads. Well, um, Roya, you brought up the subject of uh, Jewish schools uh, in, in Iran. Can you give us some sense of, uh, of their number and location? My sense is that there is probably still something between 15 to 20,000 Jews left in Iran. Um, and, and I think that those are Jews that for one reason or another have decided that uh, they need to stay. Um, some, uh, some are old. I, previously, I, I thought that it's a dying community, but it isn't simply a dying community. These are people who, for economic reasons, for uh, adjustment reasons, for attachment reasons in Iran, have decided that they can't make a life outside of Iran, or rather, they, they can't move from Iran. Um, there, have been, there were instances where um, they came to Los Angeles, there were families who came to Los Angeles or moved to Israel even in the past 10 years and then um, went back to Iran. Um, because I think that the first or second wave of Iranian Jews who left were the ones with uh, far more resources than the ones who are leaving nowadays. So they're afraid of uh, maladjustment, especially economically. Um, or they have, uh, they have attachments. But what makes it interesting um, for, for communities that are not familiar with the way the regime has been treating Iranian Jews is that um, there are Jewish schools in Iran. There is a Jewish infrastructure uh, that survives uh, even to this day in Iran. And there is a, a representative that Jews send to the Iranian parliament um, on, on their own behalf. Um, it, it, in other words, the entire, uh, everything that, that you would need in terms of infrastructure um, for the regime to claim that there is uh, a Jewish community existing in Iran is there. Um, however, on the books, uh, so to speak, and in terms of the constitution and the laws that are uh, enacted in Iran, uh, Jews, like members of other minorities and perhaps to the lesser degree uh, compared to the Baha'i, become relegated uh, to this position of secondary citizens in Iran in terms of the way that, that the laws and, and the um, uh, societal patterns have been uh, established. For instance, people, um, I just reviewed actually a book about two, three months ago for the Wall Street Journal um, by, by a husband and wife team um, uh, called Leverett, um, Hillary mm -hmm. and Flint. Leverett, it's titled Going to Tehran. Um, and it's, it's a book that makes a recommendation to the Obama administration to do with Iran what President Nixon had done with China. And, um, and the book is very much an advocacy and a campaign on the behalf of Iran's regime to drop sanctions, to uh, resume ties and relations with Iran fully, and for President Obama to, to actually uh, physically go to Iran. And in parts of that book, um, which were completely startling to me, um, it, it, the, the statistics that I just quoted to you, the, the facts that are just placed before you, uh, were cited as signs of a robust and healthy Jewish community existing in Iran. Yes, there are Jewish schools. Yes, yes, you know, there are synagogues. Um, but, but if you look at the way uh, that everything else is set up in Iran uh, legally, then you realize that the, ex the mere existence of these institutions uh, mean nothing because these are, con these are communities that cannot possibly thrive under the current circumstances in the way that everything else has been set up. For instance, um, 
Jews are not barred from attending university. No religious minority, no minority is barred from attending university. But the best universities in Iran are public universities. Um, and to, to get to them, you need to take this national SAT-like or GRE-like exam uh, to get into them. And, and you need to score extremely high. You need to be within the 10 percentile um, throughout the entire nation in order to have access to those Ivy League schools in, in Iran. And but, so whereas in the past, under the previous regime, the, the GREs uh, was the only thing that you needed to prove, it, the only source of merit um, to present you know, with your application package. Uh, nowadays, or after the revolution, uh, there was a second component added to this, which was your moral merit. So the moral merit, uh, had had extra components. It meant that you know, had you fought uh, in in the war at the time, Iran Iraq War was a big deal, um, uh, and if you had fought in the war, uh, how were you were you a a disabled person? So, uh, in other words, it was set up in such a way that the closer you were to the leadership within the regime, because another question was. Could you supply us with a reference from your uh, local uh, mosque or imam? And, and of, obviously, if you are a religious minority, the local imam isn't going to provide you with a reference letter. And there were lots and lots of other questions that, that were set up in such a way that um, only people with uh, uh, proximity to the leadership within the regime could score high on them and then um, others obviously wouldn't. And, and so while everybody is expected or uh, overtly has access to, um, to universities, um, the system is set up in such a way that you will naturally uh, uh, fail if you're not uh, a, a zealot uh, on these other components. And then those who get in um, are Shiite Muslims who have um, uh, access to the regime. And so it, it, while there are uh, Jewish schools in Iran still functioning, uh, the curriculum cannot be in Hebrew uh, because they want to have direct access to the content that's being taught in the classrooms. And, the fa and it can't be, it, another language that they can't have access to uh, cannot be used. Now, this, there's been backing and forthing on this thing where um, at times they've said Hebrew is okay as long as it's the Bible, but then um, even those materials have had to be submitted um, and approved prior to, to being taught. Um, then you have, you have a representative in the parliament, but the representative in the parliament is hampered by uh, so many other li uh, limitations. And then, you know, there are synagogues, yes, uh, they do exist, but there's no, uh, there's no rabbis that, that uh, uh, continue to live in Iran. So these are uh, community leaders who appoint themselves as, as their synagogue heads and continue to run them. So. In the uh, latest uh, report from the United States government on the status of religious freedom in the world, they say that there's a rise in the world, uh, lots of places, uh, in anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic acts. And they specifically mention Iran as one of the places where anti-Semitism has been on the uptick uh, in recent years. Now, we uh, are all familiar here in the US with the president of Iran, Mr. Ahmadinejad, uh, his Holocaust denial, and some of his other rantings. Uh, and uh, there's a sense that he has created a climate of fear among the Jewish community uh, in, in Iran. First of all, I think the situation, the question of anti-Semitism in Iran is, is an interesting one because um, the underlying scene in Iran is, is one of tension between a nation and its regime. This uh, oppositional relationship that exists between the regime and the nation uh, causes the people to have a tendency to actually do the opposite or take the opposite position 
to what the regime is uh, putting out in its propaganda. So when Ahmadinejad started to, you know, in, in his first term, which is almost seven, eight years ago, um, giving his Holocaust denial speeches and anti, vehemently anti-Israeli speeches, um, the situation in Iran turned. It didn't become Jewish friendly. I wouldn't go that far. But, but it became sort of Jewish neutral or I should say Israel neutral, that people I thought for the first time were asking this Israel thing out there that this man we dislike so deeply is so against must be something that we should at least look at. Uh, it wasn't as simplistic as saying the enemy of my enemy is my friend, but it, it uses kind of the same psychological routing of the fact that Ahmadinejad is against Israel and we are against Ahmadinejad means that we should have another look at Israel, which is why a lot of the reporters who were going to Iran uh, were very surprised by the fact that Iranians were not interested in the Palestinian cause. Iranians were not against the Palestinian cause, but Iranians were saying the Palestinian cause should be left to the Palestinians, and we don't want to decide for them. And when the war with Lebanon, between Israel and Lebanon occurred, it was just at the beginning of Ahmadinejad's term, uh, if you look at the, the lead article coverage of the New York Times um, of their correspondent uh, in Tehran, it, about within a week after the war had broken out, uh, the New York Times correspondent said, uh, Tehran is the only place where there are no pro-war uh, uh, demonstrators on the street. That, in other words, Iranians were saying, this is your, this, whatever is happening over there, it's their business. We don't want to fund it. We don't want to, we don't want our budget to be channeled to them. And we don't want, uh, we don't want to be involved. It's, it's whatever conflict there is, it's between two nations uh, that we're no part of. So um, this is, I, I've had a hard time with this myself because I think, um, and you may have witnessed this too, that there are so many Iranians who, uh, who are leaving Iran as refugees and, and they, they seem to be very Jewish friendly all of a sudden. And I have met them, and I think to myself, wait a minute, um, where is this coming from? Or what's the origin of this? But, but the truth is that the, the vehement position of the regime against Israel, and the fact that the regime is doing so economically poorly, and yet it continues to overtly uh, divert funds to Hezbollah, has created a great deal of hostility within the people. And I can't say that that has created informed opinions about Jews, reduced anti-Semitism in an intelligent way, but it has created a, a, an unusual wave that, given the rest of the Middle East, um, is, is completely an anomaly for, uh, for the region. And I think Iran now, the nation, stands as somewhat of an exception to the rule within the region, that Iranians are, are at least neutral toward the issue of Israel, and at least believe that whatever this Palestinian problem is, it's, we don't want a part of it. It should be, uh, we don't want to fund it, we don't want to intervene in it, and all that. How long will it take for a revolution to come to Iran? <laughs> Um, and, and can one be optimistic about the new generation? Um, I think one can be optimistic about the new generation. I don't want to turn this into some, some sort of a fantasy uh, dreamland that, you know, Iranians are no longer anti-Semitic. But what, what I am saying is that there has been a seismic shift, in my view, not in favor of Jews or Israel, but against the propaganda of the regime, which means that I don't know if the Palestinians are really our brothers or if it should be any of our problem. And by the way, maybe we should learn about Israel by ourselves and, and get to know the Jews on our own, which, which is in part, you know, I, I have lots of different rants and part of my rant is that I'm, I'm actually disappointed in the way that 
uh, we as a Jewish community, and maybe that's a further conversation for us, have failed to provide the counter argument to the to the to Ahmadinejad's in Persian for the Iranian community inside Iran, that Ahmadinejad denies the Holocaust, what do we say in return? Um, to how do we supply Iranians with, with correct information in their language to have access to? Um, I think we react, we get upset, as we should. But, but in, you know, we have, we talk about war and we talk about, you know, our fear and how we should protect uh, you know, the lives of Jews in Israel, as we should. But we also need to engage Iranians in, in a course of diplomacy, which is really uh, what AJC tries to do all the time. But, but one of the things that I uh, think we ought to do is to uh, provide uh, far more information than, than is available to, in Persian about Israel, about Jews, about the Holocaust, um, and bombard the airwaves um, with counterbalancing arguments to those that the regime puts out about, uh, about us. And I think uh, there, I can, what I can tell you is that in my experience, in my observation, there is a generation that's hungry to, to read it, to hear it, uh, and to learn about it. Things are bad in Iran economically. Why don't we have an Iranian spring. Mm, because I think um, the Iranian spring started in 1979. And I think the other springs that you're looking at are not exactly springs either. Um, so I, th I think, it, I know it looks to, to the rest of us that Tunisia and Egypt and Libya and Syria got started on a process that Iran has fallen behind of. Uh, on, but I think it's the reverse. I think Iran started a process, then brought it to a climactic moment and point in 2009. Everybody else followed suit, but they rewound the time and went back to 1979 in Iran to do something that Iranians did already and are done with, which is a theocratic dream. And I think people in Iran put their religious clergy in charge, melded the, the uh, institution of mosque with the institution of government, looked at it for 20 some years, then decided this is a bad idea and the two need to be separated. And there have been lots of manifestations of how Iranians have articulated the notion that as much as they remain uh, devoted uh, Muslims, they think that the idea of putting your religious leadership in charge of your government is a bad one. And they have come to this democratic understanding that the two institutions need to be separated is really deeply part of Iran. And there are lots of manifestations that I won't go into as to uh, movements that, that have taken root in Iran over the past few years uh, to show that. But I think uh, Egypt and Tunisia and um, you know even Iraq, where the United States had a has had a major presence in uh, and has tried to shape in uh, major ways, are, are still toying with the dream of giving uh, the religious class political power and seeing how it goes. And I think Iran is kind of farther closer to the spring in the fundamental existential notion that it's a bad idea and we don't want it. But I think Iranians have, have several problems. One is that they have, they have all these neighbors who, who look like they're on their democratic process but haven't succeeded. And the fact that Iraq went badly for, for as long as it did, Afghanistan went badly as long as it did, and both of them share a border with Iran. Uh, and the results of these two uh, interventions only strengthened the regime in Tehran has had a major negative impact. Um, upon the democratic movement in Iran. Um, and I think uh, the fact that the Iranian opposition, unfortunately, has failed to put forth a visible unifying face uh, is a shortcoming of the opposition, but, but a major one um, that, that 
has also hampered the democratic process. I also think that uh, it's, you know, it's <laughs> in the scheme of things, uh, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, all these transformations throughout t history have taken decades. And I think um, while it's very hard for us here to believe that uh, Iran in terms of the fundamental change is ahead, but uh, you know, it's taking that long, it's taking as long as other nations uh, have had to go through it. Uh, but I think it will come, and I think it will come to Iran before it comes to anybody else. When it comes to Iran, there are always two spaces. Uh, there's the space at home and there's the space outside. There's inside the homes, people are free. They say everything they want. They dress as they wish. Outside is, is the world of the dictator. And, and in, if you can understand that everything having to do with Iran is bifurcated, then you perhaps can have a glimpse into the fact that Iranian politics is entirely bifurcated that there is a politics that gets put out there for, for the United States and Israel, for the West, and then there is internal politics that have, n and the two have nothing to do with each other. So this is to say that as far as the Iranian people are concerned, and you can challenge me, I'm sure, tomorrow Steve Inskip from NPR, who is actually inside Iran, will say something and you'll say, oh, the woman who spoke at AJC last night totally got it wrong. It's possible. But my impression is that, uh, and my observation leads me to believe that all these issues that are issues for us aren't issues inside Iran. That the war with Israel isn't something that people wake up in the morning thinking about because they understand that this is what the president is saying to get, to, to get in under the skin of the Americans and the Jews in Israel because they need an ongoing drama with, with the Western community in order to carry on the rest of their business. That much of what the attention that we are paying to them is a result of this rhetoric that they put out in the press and get us busy and preoccupied with. But inside Iran, for the ordinary human being who has to go to work and support a family, you, you know, they couldn't care less what happens with Israel. You, you must forgive me, but, but I, I think this whole premise of red line, all of these things are meaningless, fictitious uh, lines and premises that the international community uh, in, in, its, uh, this, in its inability to deal with the question of Iran set up. What is the red line? I mean, the red line has been kind of shifting for the past 10 years because Iran has been at it for the last 15 years. Um, and for the last 10 years, uh, I can show you hundreds of headlines that Iran is a year away. And then the year gets pushed back by two and three. I think at, you know, I think at the end of the day, we have to think at this situation, not in terms of are they closer to the bomb or are they farther away from the and how far are they from the bomb? Because whatever red line there is, the, it, it has to become meaningless now that it keeps shifting and the position of it keep, keeps shifting. So we have to go back to some fundamental principles of what are we against? What, what do we want to support? And, and whether or not Iran signs any sort of nuclear acceptance or treaty, is it something that's really binding? And can the international community rely on the results of those negotiations? Which brings us in a way, um, in a strange way, to, to the cause of the Jacob Blaustein Institute and human rights and all those things. Because I, I think uh, the entire charade of nuclear negotiations m must, be, must have revealed itself uh, as being entirely a charade to, to everybody who's involved. This is not a regime with this current caste that, that wants to give in. And we have to, as, as enlightened international members of international community, look at the situation of Iran and, and have a deeper, more lasting uh, approach and understanding toward how we want to see it 
move and what our long-term plans are uh, in order to support uh, a democratic shift in Iran. We, and I think the nuclear issue just, just creates uh, a meaningless decoy in the middle of all this. Thank you, Roya. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. We would be pleased to send a complimentary DVD of this program to anyone who wishes to support Shalom TV with a tax-deductible gift of $36, double high or more, to the nonprofit organization Jewish Education in Media. Simply visit the Shalom TV website homepage and click on the Donate button to make a donation by PayPal or your credit card. And please indicate the program for which you would like a DVD. Or you can send your tax-deductible check made out to GEM to GEM, Post Office Box 180, Riverdale Station, Bronx, New York, 10471. And again, please remember to indicate which program you would like to receive on DVD with our compliments. And we thank you for your kind support.